you know, I'm the only Delano living on this road. But I'm pretty fortunate to be here, you know, to be where I am. This was my dad's land. He bought it and sold it once and bought it back again. And I decided I told him I'd like to buy it, you know, I'd like to build a house here someday. I've been lobster fishing since I got out of high school, but uh, all through high school and even, you know, middle school, uh, maybe even grade school, my dad dug clams, you know. I dug clams with him all summer. Uh, that's what we did in the summertime. That's how we made money to buy school clothes. And when I graduated high school, I started lobstering and I still dug some clams. I did some urchin diving for quite a few years. And I've done some shrimp trapping back when we had shrimp seasons. So, I mean, this is all I've ever done. Some type of fishing is all I've ever done. I'd like to be able to see a future for other people to be able to do the same. I started digging clams with my dad when I was just a little fella in school and I dug clams my whole life. I'm on the uh, shellfish committee now, the chairman of the shellfish committee. We've done everything on the ocean our whole life. The whole story right here started from this guy, so. I don't think hard work hurts anybody. It's good for you. It goes hand in hand with the fisheries. If you don't work hard, you don't make it in fishing. Right. You get out of it what you put into it. That's what it amounts to. When you get my age, you're limited on what you can do. I can't do a lot of things that I used to do. I still try to do them. <laughs> I heard him earlier telling you, get down from there. I don't know what oh, you were yeah. doing, but... <laughs> yeah, I was climbing up after something. Climbing up on the bench or something? Oh, like... in, the, in the garage, yeah. I was just climbing up on the bench. I do it all the time. <laughs> I only fell once. I was cleaning the gutters over on the garage, and I went back there, you know where my cooling unit is, and I got rain gutters up there. They got up there cleaning up. I put the ladder on an angle. I got up on that thing and went out from under me. <laughs> I landed on the cooling unit on the on the garage on one side of my on one side and then then I landed on the ground on the other side. That <laughs> was all black and blue. I didn't I think I might have cracked some ribs, but I didn't go to the doctors anymore. It's probably 15, 20 years ago was the first time I went to the doctors even to get a checkup. I've been in friendship all my life. I was born and raised down here. And my father was a lobster fisherman when I was a kid. I used to go with him lobstering and I got enough out of it when I was a kid. I learned <laughs> what it was all about. I didn't do it when I got older, I got into the clams, digging clams and then buying clams. And You know, he dug clams, he peddled clams. You know, he peddled seafood. Everybody knows my father because he used to peddle shrimp out of his truck right downtown. He's what Delano Seafood is, and we, we took after him. I always see him peddling his truck, and I said, well, that's what I wanted to do, because it was fun. I went clamming sometimes, but I didn't like it, so I found other things to do. I've always loved the retail thing, but when I got my license after I was 16, I started pedaling in my truck. And ever since that, I, I did it every winter. I pedal out of my truck shrimp and seafood for 20 years in Rockland. We've been connected with fishing in one way or another all of our lives. When climbing got hard, we just didn't go climbing. We went seaweed and went periwinkling, you know, dug worms, went lobstering anything on the ocean that we could do, we've done, you know, and, and we've had to do that to survive. I'm very proud to, you know, done what I've done, you know, and I wouldn't have been able to have done it if he, he hadn't taught me how to do it. Well, we'd done what we had to do to, in order to make a living, you know. You know, I've been from the Canadian border to New Hampshire border digging clams, and, you know, this guy here, he's done the same thing, and he's even gone, where'd you go? We were out in the state of Washington, and out there, the Indians, the Lummi Indians, they had control of all the fisheries out there at that time. And that was back in 78. And I went out there one winter and I worked for them, digging clams for them out there. And there was just wasn't nothing here. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't make any money here. So I went out there and he was, he was they were little and my kids were small. And we had to have, we had to make some money. And that was, it was good money at the time. That was real good money out there digging clams. Back then, you could make a hundred to hundred and fifty dollars out there, whereas here, it was, you couldn't get. We weren't making anything. <laughs> then we had to dig at night all the time out there, because that was the only time that the tide left long enough so you could get on the mudflats and dig where the clans was. 
You know, they're digging 20 bushel of clams out there. Yeah, there was, there was, they, they had clams like we've never seen here. And they, they weren't even digging them. They didn't, know how, they didn't know how to dig them, how to take care of them after they dug them, how to cook them, how to use them, how to do anything with them. So we, we, we taught them a lot out there you know, that, that they didn't know. And the country out there was a lot like it is here. But in the wintertime, it got cold, but it didn't get a lot of ice and snow like we do here. It didn't get ice, they didn't get ice enough to stop you from digging. Out there to get ice, if we get ice, with just real thin stuff, we could dig right through it. Same kind of country, really, that the, we got here. It's just, it's a long ways off, long ways from here. But you taught them guys how to do it. Him and his brother both went out. Yeah, my brother, he's he's gone now. But he stayed out there longer than I did. There was quite a few guys out there from Massachusetts, but there weren't many from Maine. It was just me and my brother was the only two that was from Maine that was out there. Then he started buying clamps out of this location right here. At one time I had about 30 clam diggers digging for me. And I bought off a lot of harvester for, for a lot of years. And you know, as a junior in high school, you know, you had co-op, you could get out and go to work somewhere after half a day. Well, I worked for my dad and I dug clams. I worked at the shop here and, and the school district really didn't like the idea of what we was doing. But when my dad went to meet and told him, look, this is what my boys are going to do. And I think it would benefit him a lot more. And, then they decide to let me do it. And then when the clamming got kind of tough, you know, um, I hopped on the depuration crew. The depuration crew is we go dig all these places that are closed and they go through a plant and they're processed in the plant, cleaned out, and they go on market. And we'd go from New Hampshire border to Canada border. Every town, every creek there was in the ocean. Red tide is when it gets in a warmer part of the year it's an allergy that comes on the water and the bacteria level is higher. So then they close it down until the red tide's gone, until the wind shifts or it cools off. And We had to work with the state to find out what was closed and what was open. And, and we got a lot, a lot of red tide back in the 70s and stuff. And so we started traveling up and down the state everywhere. And we were getting run out everywhere as we went because they, had, they were putting in these town ordinances. They were putting them in everywhere in the state and we didn't have one. Everybody was coming here because this was wide open. These guys would come from Brunswick, Freeport, West Bath, everywhere, and dig down here when they got red tide and we didn't have it. And they would clean us right out. And when the red tide lifted, we'd try to go over there and they'd drive us out. That's the biggest reason why he came up with putting an ordinance in the town of Friendship, the shellfish ordinance. And my dad's a very smart guy. We were just trying to preserve what we had here. We didn't keep all the out-of-towners out of it. We just had to sell, 10% of our licenses had to go to out-of-towners. So people could still get in. You might have to stand in line at the town office to get your license, but, but people that really wanted one, a lot of the guys, they got one, the guys that were good clam diggers. They, tried, they went to a lot of different towns in the state and got licenses. We had licenses in, in, you know, in different towns and stuff too, so that we could go there. And then in two or three years, once we had our ordinance, they, they all jumped on the board, Wallaber jumped on, Cushion jumped on board, you know, Damage Scott Rubber jumped on board. They all started getting the ordinances after, after we did. We wasn't the first one that come up with them, but we was in this area. The first places to come up with them was Hopswell, Brunswick, and Freeport, and then places like that. When it comes to climbing, there ain't really nobody done any more than our family's done. We've done it all. And, and I'm a big part of that, I've done it all, you know, and it's all from this guy. He, I wouldn't have been able to done it if he hadn't taught me how to do it, and he taught me real good. I didn't get the clam digging gene, but those three or four flips I made today is more than I did in the last 10 years, I think. <laughs> but I can remember, everybody always talked a lot about the town ordinances, just because it, you know, being in friendship, there were a lot of people that lived in in South Walderboro that would dig down there too and it made it kind of contentious because it cut some access out from underneath a few folks but the problem was it was people were able to come down from all over the place and and when all the other towns were having town ordinances you didn't have a choice but to do it and so I can just remember as a little kid them all talking about that quite often. We had to do it if we wanted to uh, save what we had <laughs> you know if we didn't do it we'd have been cleaned right out in no time we wouldn't have had it been worse than it is now. <laughs> what the hell did we get lost? <laughs> huh? Go back. We get done digging clams, and that's the first place we would go. When we get done digging clams, he always would take us and make sure we ate them. This was a 24-hour place back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. He used to come in there when I was a kid. 
We was riding around, raising the devil. This would be the last stop before we went home. Sometimes it was 10 o'clock, sometimes it was 2 o'clock in the morning. Now this is the first stop in the morning. Now, this, now it's just a morning spot. Now it's the first stop in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is his office. This is where he comes in to harass the waitresses. Somebody has to do it, and I got elected for it. <laughs> you know her? JC? It's gonna start being obnoxious. Oh, you know that. Sorry. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> now you got proof. She come down. Now, now you got proof. <laughs> she come down first and started picking on me, so. Yeah. Oh, please. What the hell is yeah. that? If I got a knife so I can cut it in two, I got a small yeah. mouth. Wow. It's not that small because you keep running it. <laughs> it looks horrible. It is horrible. Chicken out of it. Great big onions. He's a picky eater, isn't he? Yeah. He's something. He is a picky eater. Them onions were. I don't know where you got them. I don't know. There's something me. else. <laughs> Take that up with the cards. Take it out with you. You, you got to take it up with the coat. Heck no. <laughs> Good time for that. This is where my dad started. You know, I grew up right here. It's, you know, it's really mind-boggling to me. But what I think of when I step in here, I can remember when I was 15 years old, 16 years old coming in here, and this, all the same stuff was on the wall. You know, this, you know, when they have the two-inch law, when that come in, <clears throat> you know, that was a big thing. <laughs> I weigh them up on the scales and put them in 50 pound containers here. They bring them in and either they dump them or I dump them right in there and then we can figure out how much it is, how, much, how many pounds they got. This cooler will hold quite a few and I've seen days when I could just about fill it. <laughs> this, if we stack them up in there we could get we can get a hundred bushel in there anyway. And I've seen days when we would would buy that many cleaners, but every day they come in would have two or three bushels. Sometimes some of the guys that are real good at it, like him, he was real good at it, and they would have more than that, and I could fill that thing right full. And there was, and there was a good market for them too back then. Well, I still buy a few now, because my youngest boy, Kendall, went up to the seafood market, he sells, he sells a lot of clams up there, and I'd buy, I'd buy off of a half a dozen diggers in the summertime here now, and just try to get what he needs up there to keep him, keep him going. This land I've noticed for sale in 2001. I taught my mother and father in to buying it with me, so we all bought it together. That way they could run it as long as they wanted to run it, because I went lobster in full time too. So I said, well, you run it now, we'll all own it, and then later in life I'll take it over and I'll, I'll run it. I worked in the fish market 20 years, seven days a week. I had a lot of customers and they were really good and I loved it. And then I had my granddaughter, Crystal. She come in and helped us. She was awesome. Honestly, it was a lot of fun. So when I first started, I worked with my grandparents and I loved it because I got to see them all the time. And when I first started, I actually brought my oldest daughter now with me. She was like two or three, and she used to come to work, and everybody loved seeing her come with me, and it was, it's awesome working for a family to be able to do that. Crystal worked there quite a while. She has five kids, so she's busy, but she comes to the seafood market and works in the shack now. It's the seafood shack outside for food takeout. That took off, so that's when we've been operating that for five years. There's not many lobstermen that just go lobster in the water. Most people, they have a side thing. You have to do two or three different things to survive in life. But I think this is what we want to do because we're in the fishing industry, but we have to preserve it. I know we sell Save the Maine Lobstermen t-shirts, hats, and sweatshirts to raise money for the Maine Lobstermen Association. We'll do that every year. We've done it for the last few years, probably raised close to $20,000 for that fund now. We need them drastically and what they're doing right now to keep it going through the right whale situation. Um, that's why I joined it and I wish and urge everybody to join that and Nesma just to help because if you join it, it's going to help. We need everybody. Dustin is, I love him right to death. He's a good boy. He's smart. He loves everybody and it was a good fisherman. D Dustin was 
far better than I am at it. I mean, to say he learned it from me, he couldn't have, because he, he, he was better at everything that he did, from pogey fishing to lobstering to all of it, you know. He grew up around it, you know. He was on my boat when he was this high, you know, standing on the engine box to steer the boat. And then as he got bigger, had his own skiff and, and a few traps, and uh, he's passionate about it, you know. He, he wants us to be able to do this down the road. And he sold all of his equipment to do what he's doing today. To step aside and try to fight to keep this industry moving forward, you know, that's a big deal, you know, it's a, it was a big step. Uh, he's helping us. He's good at doing that stuff. He's good at talking with people. And... And he was one of the first NAFSA members, one of the first people I signed up, so right at the very beginning. He didn't know what his email was, but... We... <laughs> I know what it is now. <laughs> Some days I miss just going to Hall and coming home and yeah. not worrying about everything else, not worrying about what rules are coming at us and what you need to stop, slow down, change. I definitely miss just getting on the boat, going to Hall and coming home some days. Brenda's just down here trying to see what she's missing. I know what I'm missing. What's you missing? You and your brother throwing pickles, that's what's not missing. <laughs> Didn't you come in here once and Tell him you were going to pay for his lunch or something. And yeah. What was that one? That story. Yeah, he says, uh, he said, get mine for me, will you? And I said, yeah, I just went out. I went out. Next thing he knew, a cop's knocking on his door. You didn't take care of it? No, I didn't do it. He says, they asked him, he said, <clears throat> he, asked, he asked the cop, he says, what do you want? He says, well, you was up the mood as you didn't pay your bill. He said, you better go out and pay it right now. They made him come out and pay it. <laughs> But he was always, he was a jokester. He was always pulling something on you. And if you got a chance to get him back, you've done it, you know? Well, you had to get it, you had to do it to him for it to you. Yeah. I always like the story of whoever it was, he pushed all the way down through town in his car. Yeah, the old, old Marion Stora. Stora. Marion Stora. She used to, would she drive about like Rosemary Slow? Oh, she'd go on about 10, about 10 to 15, and he'd come up behind her and get right up against her bumping, and then he floored it. Took it. Her house was down there on the right where the little school is, little schoolhouse. He pushed her right by that school. She had the brakes right on trying to stop. <laughs> she only drove about 15 miles an hour and he must have had her going 40 when she went by our house. <laughs> a lot of our fisheries over the years, we fought against each other, but now it's kind of a fight for survival all together. There's just so many big issues that are bigger than one industry. Fishermen are a hard bunch to get together and get, get them to all agree on something anyway. They, I mean, some of them got their opinions and they're gonna, not going to change it. It's, they want to they keep it their way and that's it. Yeah. Yep. it. It sends a lot stronger message if we're all in unison. When I was 18, I thought, you know, when I get older, you know, it would be pretty easy, you know. It's really not the case because the price of everything has gone up so much. And then throw out all the obstacles that they're throwing at us with the the gauge increase, offshore wind, the right whale regulations that are coming at us again here shortly. We got a brief, kind of a brief pause. Who knows what's gonna happen when that, when that stuff comes down again. You know, they're not done with us. I don't ever remember having this kind of stress doing what I do. Uh, you know, I, I'll be honest, I wonder if I'm even gonna be able to survive five years from now doing this. Especially when you're my age now and I don't know anything else. It's pretty hard to start over. You know, uh, hats off to NEFSA. I mean, they, yeah, they've accomplished a lot in a short year. I mean, just look at the numbers, look at the membership numbers, uh, look at the things they're doing. If, if you're in this business, you've got to belong to somebody that's got our back. And our three boys, they always work hard. I'm proud of all of them. And my husband, he still works. There ain't nothing he can't do. He's busy all the time. And once in a while now, he'll go climbing. It means a lot to be here. I'd like to be able to think we could always be here and always do this kind of stuff. Hopefully with the help of, like my son Dustin, NEFSA, and the other organizations, hopefully we can continue to make a living and stay in business. <laughs>